the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. The first visitor in this series is Professor Stephen Schneider from Stanford. Uh, more than 30 years ago, he told us, he moved into that science at the time when nearly nobody did. And he made clear that this is not just physics, meteorology or so, it's an interdisciplinary kind of thing. As some kind of a consequence of that, he created an interdisciplinary journal, Climatic Change, and continues to serve as its editor. He's also editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia of Climate and Weather, and the author of The Genesis Strategy, Climate and Global Survival, The Co-Evolution of Climate and Life, and many other books. Uh, some but it seems to have counted what you wrote. And they came to the number of 450. Have you ever read what you wrote? <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable, such a productivity. It's so, but in addition to that, the Stanford prof professor is not only teaching for his own group, he's also teaching uh, courses in earth sciences, civil and environmental engineering, biological sciences, human biology, interdisciplinary program in environment and resources. And this is perhaps the strongest qualification inviting him as the first speaker because we have invited students from all uh, disciplines to listen to him and it is my particular pleasure of introducing him now, asking him for the floor. He said his first priority is start with a talk as soon as possible, so please do that. Thank you. Now, the title that I have up there is Climate Science Settled Enough for Policy. We'll unpack as we go along. And um, I was going to say that it, it's, there are a lot of very complex slides, and the last thing you all want uh, before dinner is too many uh, graphs and tables. And I'll try to get them over the, out of the way soon, but I'm afraid that uh, the chancellor blew my cover on that, so there's the first one. <laughs> So this is, I'm not putting this up there for the reason you think. I'm putting this up there because whenever you deal in a complex system science, and climate change is complex system. Systems means that there's more than one thing. It's the interdisciplinarity um, that the dean referred to, is you need to have language that people can understand, and you have to use metaphors. And the metaphor up here is jury. So let's unpack the jury metaphor for a bit. Now, if any of you have ever been on a jury and say it's a criminal trial, at the end of the lawyer's presentation, the judge tells the jury to go and deliberate and come back with a verdict. And the judge always tells the jury what the standards are of evidence. Anybody know what the standard is for, um, for guilt in a criminal trial? Beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, as a scientist, I've actually been in a criminal trial where I was told that, and I asked the, as it turned out, completely impertinent question, well, what's the probability of a reasonable doubt? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And they looked at me like, why did we let this guy on this jury? I mean, <laughs> and I couldn't get an answer. The answer I got was, well, that's for the jury to decide. So now I ask my law school colleagues the same question. So what's the probability of a reasonable doubt? And they say, well, that's for the jury to decide. I say, all right, you're not going to answer my question. Let me ask it backwards. What's the probability the jury made a mistake? Same question, one minus, you know, same answer. Oh, they didn't like that. <laughs> and they said, well, good judge, good jury, good lawyers, most of them are right. Maybe one or two out of a thousand would be wrong. I said, how about bad judge, bad jury, lousy lawyers? Oh, I don't know, one out of 10? I said, I sure hope it's not a capital case. Anyhow, <clears throat> we in science like to put qualifications of likelihood because as all people in business or in strategic planning in the military know, in order to determine how to deploy resources against potential threats, and if anybody knows that, the insurance companies know that, it matters how likely it is. So you want to know the consequences and the probability, and there's a standard four-letter word for that, risk. So risk is what can happen times what are the odds. Now let's go back to jury metaphor. We're not done with this cartoon yet. So what's the other kind of trial? We did criminal, civil, standards of evidence, preponderance. What's the probability of a preponderance? <laughs> More than half. By those standards, we've had discernible and detectable global warming for the last 30 years and certainly uh, human-induced warming for the last 20. Are we up to beyond a reasonable doubt today on global sci warming science? Well, it depends. At the 90% level, crossed it a long time ago. At 99.9, .9, we could still fight. So you always have to keep in mind what those numbers are, and they become absolutely consequential in the public debate when we talk about do we know enough for policy. So now let's ask the question that I asked before. Oh, before I get on there, this is just to remind you. Sorry about that. So if you remember nothing else from my talk, remember it's the preponderance. Now remember what uh, James Carville said to Bill Clinton when he ran for president uh, way back when? It's the economy, stupid, right. And that's certainly true again. So that's what you have to remember, is when somebody comes along and tells you, but wait a minute, a new study has just come along and says the sun did it. And you'll say, well, where's your data from? Well, they don't really have the source, and there's one published paper. Well, what about the 500 published papers that have other causes that are very well connected? Oh, but this falsifies it. That's not how science works. Falsification is a false doctrine. Falsification is appropriate in classical science, physics, or chemistry. Now, what's the probability that this is an acid or a base? Hmm. I don't trust this test. So what could I do? I could get a piece of litmus paper, put it in there, red or blue, it absolutely would falsify a false hypothesis or reinforce it. But when you have a complex system science, you have no idea if the new data that's collected has been collected right. You don't know whether it's meaningful. You don't know whether what was left out would completely trump the conclusion. Complex science is built on preponderance, built up over long times, and this is the other thing that people really don't understand. We love to venerate our heroes, you know, Galileo and Einstein, but that's not how most science is done. It isn't like Archimedes lounging in the bath, figuring out buoyancy and streaking across the streets of Syracuse. I have it. I mean, most of it is some really cool grad student who's gone out and made a measurement that makes absolutely no sense, uh, goes to a scientific meeting, staying in the second-rate hotels that we typically have our meetings in because we can't afford the rest, going out to dinner, drinking third-rate wine unless I'm there to order it for them. And, <laughs> and they say, what does this mean? And then everybody kicks it around, and slowly over time, people start to emerge a consensus, which then leads more models, more measurements, and we go through a process which is really a group activity. And that group activity helps to lead us toward not truth, but toward our best understanding. And then we assign confidence in our conclusions, meaning 
linked to probabilities, like the one I asked unsuccessfully of the judge and my lawyer friends. So that's the process, and I spend 10 minutes on it because the debates that we hear out there are so distorted by individuals who come along, somebody from a deep ecology group, the latest study, oh, Greenland is melting rapidly, and if you don't do something about it, the world is going to hell and we'll be all flooded. Somebody from an enterprise institute, oh, we proved the sun did it. Carbon dioxide is plant food, which is true, but it's also weed food and it also acidifies the ocean. Oops, we forgot to tell you that. Uh, and then you get these disconnected things. It's exactly what you experienced, or the world experienced from the American Tobacco Institute for 35 years, citing five equivocal studies and ignoring 50 unequivocal studies, and then arguing correctly that we don't really understand the biology whereby smoking causes cancer. So until that's resolved, we should not control it as if those 50 clear epidemiological studies wouldn't lead any prudent person to act. So you have to not be knocked off your pins by the arguments of special interests grabbing from the tails of the scientific possibility of the bell curve of all outcomes, small events which suit their client's interest or their ideology. That is exactly what you're gonna get in daily doses and you have to learn how to get through that. So let's go on now and ask the question. So is the science of global warming settled? Okay, first quiz of the day. Uh, how many think the science of global warming is settled? How many think it's not settled? How many think it's a stupid question? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Because we're talking about complex system science, and what I just told you means that there are elements that are well established, there are competing explanations, and there are speculative components. And you cannot, if you come from the deep ecology group, say that because it's well established, nothing can remain speculative, nor can you come from the Enterprise Institute and point to speculative components that are in all the literature and say, therefore, that trumps or falsifies well established. That is simply fraudulent epistemology. In other words, bad philosophy and inappropriate description of how science works in complex system science. I only wish that there were more people in Congress and in the media who understood that and don't fall for that nonsense because there are a lot of people who deliberately convey the impression that one or two results can somehow trump a community's work over 20 years. It isn't true. And they say, oh, but Galileo, look at that. They took the tube out there. They saw over a course of a couple of weeks the moons of Jupiter, and they smashed the celestial spheres. Right. And went, got the torture instruments for it, too. At least they had to look at them. So why do we celebrate Galileo and Einstein? Because they're common or because they're incredibly rare? Obvious. Most science is normal science. Most science is built on preponderance. It is exceedingly rare that one of these events is going to overthrow it. And in any case, risk, you remember, is what can happen times what are the odds. What we have to do is risk management, which corporations are very aware of. So is the Defense Department uh, or any investor, any venture capitalist. Uh, they want to know what up and downside risk is. And risk management is what we have to deal with in the face of the fact that there are some possibilities that are very scary and some possibilities that are not so bad. And you can't allow anyone to just select out of them one of them and tell you that that controls what to do. So I said, is science settled enough for policy? Well, what's the word enough? Is that a scientific word? What is it? It's a value judgment. It's whether you fear more investing present resources you could use to, to deal with uh, education, with poverty, with housing, with medicine, to work on a problem like climate change when you're not absolutely sure of the outcomes. And well, maybe we shouldn't waste the money. Maybe we'll be wrong, what the economists call a type one error, a false positive. Or whether you fear more allowing the future to unfold with the possibility of potential dangerous outcomes without trying to hedge against them, which we call a type two error, which is a false negative. There's no science in that. The science is in the risk. The how to take chances with a planetary life support system or any other entity that interests you is a personal value judgment and the way the world of politics adjudicates that is to have arguments at the right level about the values. You bring in the science to help you know what kind of risks you're facing, but the decisions are fundamentally political. So let's go on. 
So what did IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, whose job it is is to come up with preponderance of evidence and then link them to probabilities, say about warming? This, that's a very strange word, uh, unequivocal. It means it's happening. And if you look at all the thermometers and the, and the melting glaciers and plants blooming earlier and animals coming back earlier on migration, the evidence is so overwhelming you really can't reach any other conclusion. And therefore, this is in the absolutely well-established, I would argue this is established beyond a reasonable doubt by anybody's probability. But actually, it's not a very sophisticated statement because when you go out and measure all these things, Ma Earth is giving us temperature and melted glaciers. She's not saying how much is due to her and how much is due to us. That's a much more difficult question that requires what we call fingerprints. You have to look, the stratosphere cooled, the lower atmosphere warmed. If the sun did it as asserted in the editorial pages uh, of the Wall Street Journal repeatedly, uh, and by the op-eds that they put in and nobody else, um, <clears throat> then what would have happened is you would have warmed the stratosphere and the lower atmosphere. And the surface, that didn't happen. The models predict a cooling stratosphere, some ozone-depleting substances and greenhouse gases, and a warming troposphere. That happened. Does that prove it? No, that's circumstantial. Supposing you were completely ignorant, you got a 25% chance that you could have got that right, right? Because there's a 50% chance the stratosphere could have warmed, 50% it could have cooled, 50% the lower atmosphere could have warmed, 50% it could have cooled, the probability they line up, 25%. So that's not gonna get anybody to say, oh no, we have an unequivocal or a very high confidence. But that's not the only fingerprint. There are many other fingerprints, there are modeling studies, there are about six or seven of these. Every single one of them lines up supporting the notion that humans do it. The probability of chance on six things is pretty low, and IPCC said it's very likely, meaning greater than nine out of 10, that the last 30 to 50 years, the warming that's unequivocal is due to human activities. They did not pull this number this out of their left ear. It was based upon looking at the preponderance of evidence and concluding it was really very difficult to argue without, and the only reason they left a you know, a one to 10% chance is maybe there's something happening that we don't know anything about, although it's pretty unlikely. So scientists tend to be conservative. So that's how it works. That's the backdrop. Now what happens if in the media, this is put in there, and then they get somebody from some coal company with a PhD who comes along and says, oh no, it's just natural. I mean, after all, it's been warmer before 125,000 years ago. It was one to two degrees warmer than it is now. Therefore, this is just part of a natural cycle. How many of you have heard that argument? And my argument, my answer to them is there's no, there's no therefore there. It's just as logical to argue that a previous warming of comparable or even slightly larger magnitude means that this is natural as it's to argue that if you have a fever now, I had one two years ago from the norvirus, a horrible stomach flu that was 102 fever for three days. Don't ever get it if you can avoid it. Uh, their same logic says all fevers are created equal. Therefore, the next time I have 102 fever for three days, it must be the norvirus, right? It couldn't be respiratory, kidney, malaria, or something else. It's outrageous. What we do in science is we look for cause. Why was it warmer 125,000 years ago? Because the tilt of the Earth's axis and the and the and the orbital plane around—I mean, the orbital um, ellipse around the sun was such that you had more sun in the in the in the summer, and in fact, the very same models are used to project the future say it was warmer. Five to 9,000 years ago, the summers were warmer, the monsoons were more intense. The very same models, John Kutzbach did this and others, that you use to predict the future. You test them by changing the distribution of sunlight and in fact they reproduce the enhanced monsoons. So when those people are saying, aha, it's been warmer before, that refutes current warming, in fact it supports the argument for anybody who looks underneath it, and that's why you get assessments from the National Research Council or from IPCC, which are so strong in their support, yet when you end up having media find somebody with a PhD to say it isn't so, give them equal number of seconds, 10, you know, well, how are people out there supposed to be able to have an intelligent judgment when it's 10 seconds of good for you, 10 seconds of end of the world, 
end of the world and good for you being the two lowest probability outcomes in the whole debate, everything else in between being more probable and, have, and, and having scientific assessment trying to winnow out the relative probability, no wonder we get to the situation where we have political stasis. So it isn't whether science is known enough for policy, it's whether people know enough about what the preponderance of evidence it is to be able to make decent risk management judgments because they're getting their information primarily through standard media, which follows the political model of reporting, which in politics is completely fair. Get the Democrat, get the Republican. It's just what you should do. But get somebody who represents 98% of the knowledgeable community and then get somebody who represents two and give them equal status and don't warn people about that, that in my opinion is fundamentally lazy and irresponsible. And yet it's completely common. And then they accuse me of trying to repress the other side. Well, what if there isn't another side? What if there's just a very, very tiny minority and there's five sides in between of this bell curve of outcomes? If you don't report that, you're not reporting it right. And it's not just the fault of media. We're responsible because very, scientists are often very inarticulate. I'm sorry, I have to say that. Scientists talk in jargon. I'm sorry, I have to say that. And when we go to meetings, we do not get rewarded for reporting what is well established. So we go right to the cutting edge. We fight like mad. If the society cares about the problem, they're listening in with ears called journalists who then see all the contention. They're trained to get it, and they report it. So you can't blame the journalists for doing that. We need to have people to give initial talks on where the well-established consensus is so that people can understand and not be shocked when they find out. So a journalist writes a story, everything's contentious, and then they get all these nasty letters from the scientific community, how could you have said that? We never heard you say anything else. So, I mean, we have to do it too. We have to learn each other's fields. This is where interdisciplinarity is so key and understanding the context so that both sides can produce a better product that can help the public to understand. <clears throat> okay, now I will show you some of those graphs. So that's what's unequivocal. It's, uh, it's uh, three quarters of a degree Celsius warming. There's a, a, um, a 10 to 20 centimeter sea level rise, and there's a decrease in northern hemisphere snow cover associated with that. I want to spend a minute or two on your problems. This is a clear trend. Of course, you could say it's a clear trend, but maybe it's happened before. Well, the thermometers of the world have not been widespread for much more than 100 to 150 years, so it's very hard to know. So what you have to do is do proxies. You have to get paleoclimatologists in the game. You have to get people who look at tree ring widths, who look at coral reef oxygen isotopes, who look at, at pollen, and then try to figure out what the things were back here to know how likely that is. And the answer is it's not too many centuries that warm up three quarters of a degree. In fact, I don't think anything like that's been observed in modern times. So it's unusual. That doesn't mean we did it. It's just unusual. But so that trend is clear when you look over the long distance. But I want you to take a look. There was a period from 1950 to 1970s when the northern hemisphere was getting cooler and the snow cover was increasing, some people were predicting ice ages. I was even one of the ones who said that dust and smoke could cause cooling uh, over CO2. I was wrong. I was glad I figured out why I was wrong two years later and published what was wrong with it before any of the critics. What was wrong with it was that we assumed dust was global when it's really regional. And we assumed that there was only one greenhouse gas, CO2, and we now know there were four or five. Put the two together and warming became pretty likely somewhere after 1974. But that was there. That's false. That is not a trend. It was for that period. What about some environmental groups that have gone up to the cold period and then looked at this radical warming that we had during that time period. These are false trends. And it's very common for people to do what statisticians call cherry pick. That is to go get little segments of data, show that, don't show the whole record, and then say I falsified it, or that this is not established. And that's completely typical. Climate change is about long-term global. You will not see the trend in 10 years. Not there, because it's the natural fluctuations. Now we got a problem. We have political scientists in the room? Couple? Yeah. Well, it's what I like to call, I think some of them too call, the first law of political science, which is that all politics is local. And I have a lemma, 
and short term. And all climate change is global and long term. Doesn't match well to the media, doesn't match well to politics. Yet, what happens long term and global affects all places local and you have to do what we call downscaling to be able to get there. So all of these things are part of the context that we need to understand and how we have to be literate about these things. Now, if I show you one glacier that's here and you know I'm going to show you the melting picture expected, it means nothing. So what does IPCC do? It looks at all of them and says 95% of them are melting. Now, it's pretty hard not to argue that that's a strong preponderance. It's very likely to be connected to a global trend. So there's the 1928 picture, and then there's the after picture. And there are quite a number of them. <clears throat> OK, so while we're on glaciers, uh, all that this tells you is that I'm not a very good artist with PowerPoint. That's an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> You all recognize that immediately, I'm sure. And it's somewhere up around 72 degrees. And this summer, um, my wife, Terry Root, and I went to, uh, to Greenland at the invitation of the Inuit Ar um, uh, Circumpolar Council of Greenland to discuss their really radical transformation in warming and, and not just the physical and biological implications, but the cultural and social implications for changing hunting culture and for the opportunity for minerals which they are really worried about uh, because how that's managed will determine you know, what happens to culture and, and pollution. But in any case, there you are up there, and that's a photograph of the western edge of the Greenland ice sheet, so there's the big high ice. There you can see a rapidly uh, a moving ice stream where the ice goes about into the sea and the icebergs come out. Now up there, it's cold, and some groups have said, I've falsified the melting because the snow is building up in the center of Antarctica and in the highest parts of Greenland. And that's not only true, that's what the model forecast. Because the atmosphere holds more moisture when it's warmer than when it's colder. So as long as you're well below freezing, you're going to build up more snow. But the models also predicted that the sides would melt. But as you'll soon see, nowhere is near as fast as they're actually melting. So what you would expect to validate the forecast is build up up here and shrinkage over here. So these are all fjords. But you can't tell anything in one snapshot. The one thing I want you to see, you see a couple of little dots there? Now those little dots, now I'll take out my trusty telephoto. Those are meltwater ponds. You see these little things? Those are called moulons. In this election season, we should call them rivers to nowhere. That's what they look like, uh, even though some people don't believe that they have anything to do with planetary temperature. Well, no, planetary temperature, but it's all act of God. Anyhow, the question with the Mulan is, is this meltwater, which is disappearing down under the ice sheet, refreezing halfway down, or is it going to the bottom, lubricating the ice sheet, thereby causing it to slip more, generating friction, causing it to slip more in an unstable mode? That will raise sea level five meters in the next several centuries or not. Well, there are people who are fighting bitterly about what that, whether that is. It's hard to make a direct measurement. So they've lowered, several people have lowered cameras down there. They get stuck on ledges. So they've given up. So you know what they did this summer? This is Connie Stefan from University of Colorado. I think it's brilliant. They threw in 100 rubber duckies <laughs> with numbers on the side and phone numbers. And anybody finds one, you better phone it. If it shows up in the next 10 years, it's pretty scary. You know, so we'll have to find out. <coughs> but what hangs in the balance is the sea levels of the Earth. And that's where we have a problem. The question about is the science settled enough for policy is how much risk do you want to take with the system? And again, that's risk management. So let's go on. So here's a picture of the relative melting uh, in 92 and in 2002. It's substantially expanded. Competing explanations. School one, internal oscillations in the climate system, just a fluctuation in the North Atlantic climate and the North Atlantic oscillation. School number two, way too big for that. It's caused by global warming. Both sides still arguing that they could be right. So let's take a look at the, this is the small town of Ilulisat, which is right by the Jakobshaven 
ice stream, which is the fastest um, uh, moving ice stream of any volume in the world. And, oh, Terry and I, there we were, and there's a Lula sat behind us. And that was this summer. So there's the, there's the glacier, but it isn't actually the ice stream of the glacier. That's where it was in 1850. Going back, this is somewhere around 2000. About a third of it disappeared in the last 10 years. It's a very rapid disappearance. Why does that matter? Supposing it's sitting out there or not. What matters is that back here, the ice is much taller. As a result, when it hits the water, it calves and you get much bigger icebergs, which means faster rate of sea level rise because melting ice in the, that's already in the water doesn't do anything any more than melting the ice cube in your Coke makes it flow out. You've already had Archimedes when you put the ice cube in there. But what's on the land matters. There are all those melt things when you look at a thing. So that's what's, what's interesting is this is receding too, and it influences the sea level rise rates. So there's the town again. And see the mountain range back there? You know what those are? They're not mountains. They're icebergs. And because of they're coming off the very high glaciers, some of them are amazingly high, 500 to 1,000 feet. So we went out there. This one just flipped over. And uh, it's a good thing we weren't anywhere near it. It flipped over the week before because when you get a rather big thing that because the bottom erodes and then the top gets heavy and then it flips over, there's going to be quite a little local tsunami. <clears throat> and uh, you, if they can find you, uh, will get a posthumous Darwin Award. <laughs> Can you believe that is an iceberg? It's almost 1,000 feet tall. We stayed three miles away. That's a telephoto. They really are quite spectacular, especially at sunset. But anyhow, enough pretty pictures. Let's go on. This is 2005. Do you notice the melting is even larger? So how can you distinguish between these competing explanations? What does science do? So Connie Stefan and his colleagues went up and they sunk pipes. That's where these little red things are first recorded melt. You have annual layers of ice. And they went back and looked over a period of time and said, let's go back and see when did it melt before in this warm interglacial period. And the answer was at those red spots, the first melt was then. That's tipping me closer to away from natural variability to global warming. I'm not ready for beyond a reasonable doubt, but I'm getting up to likely, you know, two-thirds to 90 percent. And that's exactly how the community works. It looks at this accumulated evidence and it tries to draw preponderance and we try to say, well, wait a minute, is there any other factor that could have caused this? This is, and it gets pretty hard to argue it. But I just wanted to give you a cross-section of how the community works. Okay, so here's our unequivocal again, but there's the rate if you start the line 150 years ago. There's the rate if you start it 100 years ago. There's the rate if you start it 50 years ago. There's the rate 25 years ago. Now, I recently testified to the, to the uh, House Science and Technology Committee, and the good congressman, uh, Professor Rohrbacher, uh, said, hey, look, from 1998 till now, we have global cooling. I've refuted global warming. And we tried to remind him that you don't refute anything in 10 years, that if I'd picked that period up to there, uh, we could have said we're going to hell in a handbasket, and that 25 years is borderline too short to talk about climate. And again, you just have to deal with this kind of stuff. OK, how do you deal in the future? How do you predict? In order to know that, it's very interdisciplinary. You have to predict demography, how many people in the world. What standards of living will they demand? And what technology will you, use, will you use? So that's how you try to do that. Some of us use integrated assessment models. Charlie uses those. I use those. Many colleagues. So how do you scientifically analyze the future? Well, you need one of these. You need a crystal ball. Because the future hasn't happened. How much data is there on the future? Don't answer it once. Yeah. OK, none. So what you do is you use existing empirical data to construct a model of the atmosphere, a model of the oceans, a model of the chemistry, a model of the population, a model of technological growth, how technological growth depends on the price of conventional energy, all this kind of stuff. And it's all empirically grounded, 
But then you run it forward in coupled mode outside of the range for which you derive the empiricism, and then you have to decide how much confidence you want to assign. It is the only way to play the game. There is no analogy in the past, because there's no time in the past when we were changing aerosols, greenhouse gases, land use, exactly at the rate and magnitudes that we're doing now. So the reason we look backwards is why I told you before, in order to calibrate our understanding and test our tools, not to give us a metaphor. So we have to get stuck with these kinds of models. So how do we do it? Well, that's the crystal ball that we really have. You know, you can see through some of it. Some of it's, you know, partly cloudy, and some of it's speculative. So I like that. So how do you forecast the future? Well, first you have to say, how much are we emitting, right? Uh, we're not we're certain why they disappeared, but archaeologists speculate it may have had something to do with their size. Uh, if I'm worried about it, the Wall Street Journal says it's a freedom car, because if you're going to be in a collision, it's always better to be the bowling ball than the billiard ball. Uh, it, and it's a freedom machine, and we are entitled to this. Uh, and of course, they forgot to tell you that the rollover accidents make them, right, slightly less safe than, uh, than uh, Mercedes and Volvos and a lot of other sedans, and they're endangering other people. And what you're really talking about is a social question about whether one's individual freedom has the right to endanger others, and that has nothing to do with technology. That's a where to put a line in the sand politically between private rights and public protection, which is exactly what politics should be doing. So in any case, whether you want to like them or not like them isn't my point. It's that when you're forecasting the future, you've got a fan of uncertainty called scenarios of how many of what the emissions are going to be like, and you've got to be able to predict what the vehicle's going to be, not only here, but in China and India and other places. And all of that has to be done as scientifically as you can, meaning is constructed on the best basis that you have for people's behavior. Now, some of you are old enough to remember Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> so where was that? Subway walls. How about Washington, D.C. Metro? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> I wish I had. <laughs> Actually, this picture was taken from the head of the National Science Board, who was going to chair his meeting, saw the picture, ran back to his room, got his camera, took a picture because he was afraid somebody might have taken the graffiti off by the time he got back. And this has now made the rounds of many, many of us. But again, whether you like them or not, you've got to predict them. You hear the trumpets playing. There I am with my Honda Civic Hybrid. And that's not even good relative to plug-ins. But then, what are the differential costs of plug-ins relative to energy efficiency if you want to reduce a ton of CO2? Plug-ins are a hell of a lot more expensive per pound that you're going to put off. So everything has to be looked at carefully. I'll get to that later. And this is in, in South Australia in Adelaide. Kids love that. That's Benny the biodiesel bus. Is that good or bad? It all depends upon how you got the biodiesel. If you use food fuel stocks, it's probably worse than nothing. If you use waste, it's probably pretty good. If you used algae, it's great, you know, at least so far. So everything, this is, this is a, an issue where devil's in details. And what we have to predict is what are we going to do in the future given probable investments, given learning curves, and given the relationship between learning curves, that's how much it will cost to produce a unit, depending on the incentives that are put in place. All of that is part of climate policy. And so what IPCC did is it gave you scenarios. It did what you do when you're trying to predict a future where you can't know the answer. And so that's what scenarios look like. So the green is historic. That's what's happened up to 2000. This is a 2000 report called Special Report on Emission Scenarios. This is the high one. A1 is a globalized world of, of mobilized capital. FI is fossil intensive, use of cheap available coal, oil, and gas. Uh, maybe even some tar sands and oil shales are in there. And it triples carbon dioxide and goes beyond it in the 21st, in the 22nd century. The bottom one is called B1, uh, which is a world of egalitarian sharing. So here we have sort of business as usual greed and egalitarian sharing. They said they were all um, um, equally likely, but I want to challenge that. How many people here think that egalitarian sharing is more likely than business as usual greed? We got one. 
okay, I hope you're right. Uh, <laughs> And I'm going to do everything in my power to make that happen, but I'm not too confident in my ability or a lot of our ability, but I hope it's true. By the way, we can do well better than B1. If we follow what California has said, we can go, B1 is still a doubling. I mean, if we listen to the governor, I mean, we're going to do a lot better than B1, and I'm hopeful, but <clears throat> nobody's assigned probabilities. Therefore, how do you do risk management? So what the community does is it has a fan of uncertainties and they call it, and, and, and it has to do with human behavior. And then we investigate high scenario versus low scenario. What does that mean in terms of impact? So let me get there. 10 more minutes, okay? With yes, you? that's perfect. Okay, I was just looking at my watch and determining that. So two fans of uncertainty. This is emissions scenario uncertainty. That's the human behavior part. So we're looking out into the future 100 years, and that's whether you have a very large emissions or lower emissions. But that's not the only fan of uncertainty. You teach science here as well as policy, and we know that the internal dynamics of the climate system adds another factor of three uncertainty. It's called climate sensitivity. How much does the Earth warm up if you doubled CO2? Well, in order to answer that, you have to know what happens to clouds, what happens to ice, and the very small and subtle changes that can double the calculation you've made in their absence or half it. And we have not gotten any closer to answering that question in 30 years than when some of us first started investigating it back then. So here's the second fan of uncertainty. So when you're really taking a look at the whole thing, here's, here's a factor of three, there's a factor of three. You're looking between about prediction in the future somewhere between one degree C more than we have now. That's more than twice what we've had. That is not a happy scenario. Up to six times 6.4, well beyond where we are now. The temperature difference between an ice age and an interglacial cycle in a century, which I don't hesitate to call catastrophic in terms of souped up hurricanes and ice melts and all that other usual litany. So the question is, how do you do risk management in the face of that? Well, we got to tell the truth, and the truth is there it sits. But let me do a little more. Well, I could show you a probability density function, uh, but I'll spare you and I'll show you a probability density function in the form of, of a wheel of fortune. So here's our lucky slots, quote unquote lucky, more than doubling the warming we've had so far, 5, 10% of it. There are the odds up there. 4% of less than 1, 11%, 11.4. I laugh about those numbers. I have a standard mantra, which is please don't take model-generated, deeply assumptive uh, numerical results literally, but please take the framework seriously. Because even though you could easily argue any of these numbers, this is from MIT model, could easily be wrong, the basic idea is the same. And then you've got some 3 or 5% probability of these really catastrophic outcomes. So I was asked at a meeting, I think Charlie may have been there, this was probably one of the snow mass fora that we go to in the summer where we suffer and slave and never go hiking and never go do anything nice, you know, Aspen, just a dull, boring place. You know, and um, <clears throat> this is not second-rate hotels. <laughs> but in any case, the, the bottom line is we go there and one of my economist friends in the audience, and it wasn't Charlie, uh, said, wait a minute, Steve, you think there's only about uh, a 10% chance of the really catastrophic outcomes, and you want to deny the Chinese a chance to be able to have equality with us, and you want to unemploy the auto workers making the big cars and put out, make the coal miners' daughters live in poverty. So I came up with this lame thing. We were eating dinner with salmon, and I said, you know, Rob, I think it was Rob, <laughs> doesn't that fit? I said, there's only a 10% um, a chance that the salmonella in the salmon, so of course you're going to eat it. And I thought I was pretty clever, and then I had a much better one, and I did a poll, so we'll do a poll. And I said, okay, how many people have had a serious fire in their houses, this room? Come on. In your house or your parents' house? A couple of people, right, out of a 200. It's a couple of percent, that's typical. How many of you or your family have fire insurance? Fools. I mean, it's way less than 10%. So why do we do that? Because 
we're fundamentally risk averse on high consequences. So are we fundamentally risk averse on these slots? Even these are not nice. We've already had a significant increase in the, um, in the number of, of category four and five hurricanes. That's again in competing explanations. There are people arguing internal dynamics. Others arguing it's global warming of the oceans. My own personal view is it's both with a little more on warming because if it were just internal dynamics, then you only would have seen it in the North Atlantic, but you saw it in the North Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific. Probability of all of that being internal dynamics is to me, not very high, um, but it's still, IPCC said it was more likely than not. So that's the kind of, of things that you look at. So let me quickly, in my remaining five minutes, do a little bit of a, a litany of impacts. So we'll go through them quickly. Now this is to remind us that not all impacts are negative. <laughs> and it would be false to say they are. Right, the good news is the current rate of global warming, we should be able to swim over there and eat them in under five years. Of course, there's a few problems with the cartoon. I think his resource base may not get him to five years. Any storm surgeon, he's in trouble, and in fact, the biggest victim out there is probably these guys, because 90% of big fish have already been fished out. They'll never make a year, but that's another story. In any case, <laughs> shipping industry. Okay, Charlie, this one's for you. So I show you a ship. Shipping, I was in, as I said, we were in Greenland. Two years ago, there were 27 cruise ships in Greenland. This summer, there were 45, and the population of those cruise ships was about 50, 60,000 people, more than the Inuits that live in Greenland. This is cultural change. So opening up the Arctic, the first year ever that the Northwest and the Northeast Passage was open that we've been making measurements, this is going to be a calculatable boon to the shipping industry. You can calculate how many tens of millions it's going to save. You can throw it in your cost-benefit analysis and work it out. But what else is going on up in the Arctic? This, you don't need to read this, but this is the fact that the Inuits, who are getting their culture melted out from under them, are in the process of working out a petition to sue the polluters because their culture is being destroyed. What's the monetary value of the culture of the Inuits? which have been there for four or 5,000 years, relative to the shipping industry, and how do you put that into a cost-benefit analysis? This is for you, Charlie. I'll pass it to somebody else. Yeah. And then, what about the polar bear ecosystem? I don't never understand why polar bears are such amazing, cute symbols of global warming. I mean, you show them and they get all this sympathy in, 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 in Australia and South America. Anybody ever been up with a polar bear? Yeah, now what do you have when you're out there on the ice? A high, a no, shotgun's not powerful enough. A high-powered rifle. And anybody who goes over and pets it, hey, nice bear, talk about Darwin Award, you're it. <laughs> I mean, the reason we want these guys is not because they're nice, but because they belong there. They're the product of a couple of million years of the coevolution of climate and life. And what arrogance that one species, us, hell-bent on increasing our numbers and our standards of living are willing to threaten, what IPCC said, between 20 and 40 percent of the species if we warm up in the middle to the high range of that, of that wheel of fortune I showed you. And what it costs to fix it is trillions of dollars, I agree with that, but that's such a small fraction of the growth rate of the GDP, it amounts to being 500 percent per capita richer in 2101 with 400 parts or 450 parts per million CO2 or being 500% per capita richer in 2100 with 800 parts per million. To me, that's cheap, but that's not calculus. That's a value judgment about what's important. So polar bears, the question is how do you value them? I'll skip that. I just want to end it by saying that when you're an iconic symbol, you've got to take some hits. The actual website on which you see this. <laughs> now, I want to know how this guy from the Southern Hemisphere made it across the warning track. <laughs> you notice that this guy didn't pull, this guy listened to the American Tobacco Institute. See, he's smiling, he's got these guys. Well, anyhow, this is what I call the victims as villains. So let's end with the revenge of the polar bear, right? The, uh, the bad news is the ice cap is melting and it's going to be almost impossible to catch seals. The good news is if we keep moving south, there's tons of fat animals called humans who can't run very fast. <laughs> this is called the map of meat. Uh, and, and you will notice that it is both um, uh, age, uh, 
uh, gender and ethnically uh, appropriate. <laughs> so the bottom line, and here's where we really have to, sorry, I gotta get serious again to end the talk, is we have to deal with not only the question about how do you try to make decisions across incommensurate metrics like the value of the polar bear ecosystem or the, uh, or the Inuit culture or the benefits of the shipping industry or the longer growing seasons and CO2 fertilization in northern agriculture followed by reduction in yields in southern agriculture and even if it were a wash in a model that the billions made in the north were equal to the billions lost in the south, would it be a wash if the rich got richer, the poor got poorer and the rich were responsible for 75% of the accumulated emissions? This is the reason why the US got booed in Bali because when it went there and started arguing level playing field in terms of the amount of cutting that we're doing, we were reminded that the playing field hasn't been level for 100 years. And therefore, who takes first steps has to be people who've accumulated it, and therefore you have the equity dimension thrown in. On the other hand, when China says, or India, that we are going to catch up to you before we take targets, and you multiply at times their vast populations. Remember IPAT, that. What they're really saying, and let me be really nasty, is we're gonna hold the sustainability agenda of the planet hostage to our notion of equity. And what did the US say when George Bush Sr. went, and to his credit, signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 92, the US Senate ratified it, it's the law of the land and it commits us to stabilizing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at a level that prevents dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. I don't know, we haven't been doing it. Is that an impeachable offense? It hasn't been yet. But the bottom line is Bush also said then that the US standard of living is not up for negotiation. In other words, we're gonna hold the sustainability agenda of the planet hostage to our notion of consumption. So what have we got? a planetary train wreck. And the only way around that is to replace the usual C word, competition, with the one we need, cooperation, because we have got to work and cooperate both internally at home and with other countries so that they can have a decent standard of living brought about by energy service, but it doesn't have to be the same energy we used in the Victorian Industrial Revolution. We have to learn to leapfrog over it through, as you've heard from Ernst many times, I'm sure, through performance standards, through efficiency, through public-private partnerships that help give us uh, incentives so we can invent our way out of the problem eventually on shadow prices on carbon and maybe sometime a century from now if we can't do anything geoengineering, which you can ask me about if you want to. But that's the agenda and it's very difficult to, set, to summarize that agenda in a 20 second soundbite on the evening news and therefore my last line is at night when I worry, what I really worry about is how do we get democracy to survive complexity? Because democracy works well when the political leadership is aware of the values of the public, but if they're so disconnected from the nature of the issues, how do they express a meaningful value? And that's where public education and the work of a school like this is so critical if we're to have a future that has a chance to have people express reasonable opinions. Thank you very much. Uh, well, after all, we have policies uh, and the RAND Corporation has paid lots of money and I think rightly so to analyze scenarios that threaten us at probably well lower probabilities than that so that we have four structures that we have planning on to do it. Um, of course, nobody expects them to happen, but you, you've got to be ready. I guess my, my answer uh, is how high would the 1% case be? 1% could have a climate sensitivity that's trivially small. Remember, the probability distribution has two tails. Or it could have one out there at, I don't know, eight or nine or 10 degrees, which would be considerably worse than the, than the wheel of fortune I showed you, which was an assumption for about two and a half times increase in CO2 with uh, a probability distribution that comes from the literature where very few models go up above six. Now there's a model in the UK that goes up to 13, but I don't believe it. Uh, 
So at some stage, if you want to do a 1%, you're going to have very, very high potential risks. I would argue at a 1% probability that the melt in Greenland that we're now observing already is irreversible and nothing we do could stop it. Um, Jim Hansen has said that, well, one degree, we're going to lose it. I would say at one degree, which remember, we're three quarters now, one degree more, uh, I wouldn't assign that as a 90% likelihood we're going to lose Greenland. I'd probably put it more like 30. That's, but this is scientists' intuition. And at two degrees, I'm going to put it at 50. And at four degrees, I'm going to put it at, you know, at 90. And at five degrees or above, I'm going to put it at 99.9. So those are pretty consequential because we're talking there five to 10 meters of sea level rise associated with Greenland and West Antarctica. If that happens, uh, it might take several centuries to get there, so then we have to ask, you know, what's the appropriate discount rate for an ice sheet as opposed to a cash flow transaction where a rate of market rate makes sense, but for an ice sheet, does that make sense for the sustainability? Uh, I don't, you know, I, I do tell people they have to think about outliers, but I think that the middle of the probability distribution is scary enough. I mean, we already have intensified we, uh, hurricanes. We already have uh, uh, a factor of three to four increase in f wildfire in the west. Uh, we have the Arctic sea ice now mostly first-year ice instead of multi-year ice. It's 20% reduced. It probably will be gone in the summer in the next decade or two. Greenland is going fast, uh, and sea levels are rising. I mean, what else do we need? I mean, I'm, I'm already motivated with conventional stuff. But when you add on top of that the possibility of some of the really, really scary outliers, it seems to me that we need to get on with the job. And I'm, I hear from some people, well, we have 10 years left. Uh, first time I'm aware of that anybody testified to the US Senate on the relevance of climate change to energy policy was a 1979 hearing that Ribicoff and Muskie called to oppose the Carter Sinfuels. You may remember that way back when, and it was um, Roger Revelle and Wally Broker and, and uh, Gordon McDonald and me, and we opposed the president that we all supported, and I was on his, his, his policy task force for doing that. We had 10 years then to avoid some dangerous climate changes. So I don't get hung up on numbers, and I, the EU says two degrees warming, right? Um, we're going to be so far above two degrees at the 1% level. <laughs> but, you know, at 1.8, we're not okay. At 2.2, the world doesn't come to an end. So I don't like to get hung up on numbers. Let's just do as much as we can, as fast as we can. We'll keep those 1% in mind and, and may have them make us nervous, but let's do what's cost-effective and fair as fast as we okay, can. Let's take that to